Well, good evening to you, and thank you for being here for this final service of the Gospel meeting as we continue our worship to God on His day, the Lord's day. It would not be right for me to end this meeting without saying thank you. Thank you for the invitation, the opportunity to be with you, to get to know you, to interact with you, and be encouraged by this good church of God's people. When we came here, we knew two people in Pennsylvania. We knew Rusty and we knew Laura. And now we know you guys too. And I hope that we've encouraged you as you guys have so greatly encouraged us during this gospel meeting. We've been thinking about the theme of revival. Lord, revive us again. Because there are occasions in our life where we need God to revive us. We began on Friday night by exploring Psalm 85, a recipe for revival. We then explored the next night our Lord's words about revival in our heart. In David's own life, as he writes by inspiration about his own sin with Bathsheba, how he stood before God needing God's forgiveness there in Psalm 32. We explored this morning Haggai chapter 1 when our focus needs to be revived. During our morning worship hour, we talked about Nehemiah 12 when our worship needs to be revived. And on and on we could go with so many different applications in our individual spiritual life. But let's think about this idea of revival from one more vantage point before our time ends together. Not just when revival is needed on an individual standpoint. But what about times and occasions when a revival is needed in a congregational way? When a local church needs to be revived. What about those moments? If you have your Bible, locate with me tonight Revelation chapter 2. And let's dial in our focus here in Revelation chapter 2 to verses 1 through 7 together. Revelation was written to a group of Christians in Asia Minor because of the intense persecution they were experiencing. In a nutshell, this book is a message of comfort and hope. That through Jesus Christ, they would stand victorious over all of their earthly oppressors and ultimately the greatest adversary himself being the devil. But before our Lord gave these churches this message of comfort and hope, He spends two, as we see it, chapters doing something incredible. Our Savior spends time giving each of these seven congregations an x-ray picture of their true spiritual condition. Our Lord addresses each of them one by one. He tells each church something about Himself. Then He tells them what He knows about them as a congregation. And in most cases, our Lord has words of compliments, but also words of criticism. And He ends with words of comfort, but also words of warnings and threats. Here in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, our Lord begins this series of addresses, seven letters to seven churches, by addressing the church in Ephesus. And friends, I believe these seven verses are crammed with truth that will help us in moments when our church, our local church, our congregation needs to be revitalized, needs to be restored, needs to be revived again. Let's read these verses together. Then we'll unpack them verse by verse together. The Lord says to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your 
patient endurance. How you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at the first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet you have this. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. The one who conquers, I will give or I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Friends, before us, in those seven verses, we have what we might describe as a surprising situation. We have a church that outwardly appears to be thriving, appears to be doing really, really well. And they have so many good things going for them, yet Jesus says, there's this glaring problem I have against you. You need to be revived. You need to be restored. You need more love among you. And in these seven verses, our Lord challenges us to look inward and make the application to ourselves as a local church of His people. Now let's take these verses and think about four major things we can learn from this passage. We see in these verses the Christ. We see in these verses the commendation. We see in these verses the complaint or the criticism. And then we see number four, the cure. Let's think about each of those one by one and make some application. Go back with me to verse 1 and watch how Jesus begins this address by describing Himself. He talks about the Christ. In Revelation chapter 1, this incredible book begins with a beautiful picture of who Jesus is. And in each of these various addresses, our Lord reaches back to chapter 1 and uses something in that description to describe Himself to these churches. And our Lord says not just one thing in verse 1 about Himself, but He mentions two very important truths in verse 1 about the Christ. Watch again what He says. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of Him, that being Jesus, who holds the seven stars in His right hand. Then, number two, who walks among the seven stars golden lampstands. Our Lord says, I want you to know who I am. I want you to know who's talking to you. I want you to know the one who has been examining you. I want you to know the one who has these stirring words for you. And number one, I'm the one who holds the seven stars in my right hand. Now, this book is very filled with language that's figurative language. But if we back up just one verse in this flow of context, we learn from this very book the identity of the seven stars in the Lord's right hand. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, Notice this, the seven stars are the angels or the messengers of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So when our Lord says, I hold seven stars in my right hand, He's talking about seven individuals who were representatives of these congregations, recipients of this letter, responsible for delivering this letter, reading this letter to the various churches. These are human beings He's talking about. Maybe it was an elder. Maybe it was a preacher. 
Maybe it was some prominent church member, but the Lord says, whoever they are, I hold these individuals in my right hand. Our Lord has the power. Our Lord is the one who has the authority. And our Lord has these human messengers right there in His strong, powerful, authoritative hand. Bear in mind that these seven churches were experiencing severe persecution. There's also comfort wrapped up in that thought. The Lord's got you in His hand. We would sometimes sing as kids, wouldn't we? He's got the whole world where in His hands. And that's exactly what Jesus says about these seven representatives from the churches. Then he says, though, secondly, there about the Christ in verse 1, I'm the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now again, chapter 1, verse 20, these seven lampstands, they represent in figurative language the seven churches. So we're talking about seven congregations of God's people referred to as golden lampstands. They're golden because the church is precious to Jesus. And they're lampstands because the church is meant to be the light of the world. But friend, don't miss it. Our Lord's got those seven messengers in His hand. And among these seven lampstands, these seven churches, our Lord has been walking. Our Lord, as we're learning here in verse 1, not only has the power, not only has the authority, but He is intimately aware of His churches. He's not somewhere far and distant away Unaware of what's really taking place on the inside, the Lord is still, isn't He, walking among His churches. Examining us, inspecting us, scrutinizing us. Friend, what would the Lord say about us? You see, our Lord prefaces this letter by saying, I want you to know who I am. And it's this Christ who's about to deliver some very, very stirring words to this church. You see, we serve the same Christ today who knows His church, who loves His church, who's the authority in His church. Oh, we should be listening to the words of the Christ. Now watch here secondly in this passage that we move from the Christ to the commendation. Our Lord says, I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you've not grown weary. Our Lord has some great things to say about this church because yet again, He knows them. I want you to see there in verse 1, our Lord begins addressing this church by saying, I know. And you can read through Revelation chapter 3, every single church, our Lord said the same thing, I know, I know, I know your works. The word know here is a very important term in Revelation because... It's a knowledge that is full and complete. We might say it this way, I know everything there is to know about you and your works. This is a full, complete knowledge attained because someone has been searching something. Again, back up one verse. He knows all there is to know about this church because where is He? He's right there among them. He's walking among them. He's scrutinizing them. So what does Jesus know about Ephesus? Well, I want you to see here four things we can learn in our Lord's commendation. Number one, our Lord commends them because they were a serving church. 
in verse 2, he specifies their works. They were not a workless congregation. They were involved, yea, busying themselves, doing many great works for Jesus. They were also, number two, a sacrificing church. He references their works, then he uses this term, I know your works, your toil. The word toil suggests work, but not just any kind of work. Work to the point of being exhausted. Have you ever worked so hard you came home just physically exhausted? You were busying yourself that day on your job or in your home or doing this task or that task and you were just physically exhausted at the end of that day. Here is a church involved in doing great works for Jesus. Here is a church exhausting themselves for Jesus. They were sacrificing, no doubt, much time, much effort, much energy for Jesus. They were sacrificing church. They were also, number three, a steadfast church. Notice there in verse 2, their works, their toil. Then our Savior mentions their patient endurance. Drop down to verse 3. The order is reversed. Their enduring Patiently. Their patient endurance and their enduring patiently. These seven churches were trying to be the church in a hostile, hostile world. Not just because of the persecutions they were experiencing, but because of the pressures they were experiencing based on the wicked culture around them. Sometimes we think, how could things get any worse than they are right now? Look how immoral. Look how wicked. But folks, think about the age in which these Christians lived. They were being the church in wicked, wicked environments. And on top of all of that, they're being persecuted greatly for the cause of Christ. And yet these Christians have remained steadfast. They've not given in to pressure from the world or persecution from the world. They're still serving the Lord relentlessly. And then one last thing about this commendation, they were a separate church. The Lord specifies there in verse 2 how there were individuals among them who claimed to be apostles. They claimed to be spokesmen from God, but our Lord says they're not, and you know they're not because you've put them to the test. Drop down to verse 6. Our Lord says, yet you have this, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans. He mentions some false teachers by name, the Nicolaitans, which I hate. If you read ahead in your Bible, you will encounter the church in Pergamum and then the church in Thyatira. And sadly, both churches were guilty of doing the opposite of what Ephesus has been doing. They allowed false teachers and false teaching to plague those churches. They were compromising. They were tolerant churches. And our Lord was not pleased with their tolerance, with their compromises. But folks, that's not Ephesus. They've put these teachers to the test. They, if you will, opened up their scriptures and examined what the apostles and God's true spokesmen really were saying. And they would not allow false teaching to permeate those churches. Now suppose we just stop right there. If we stop right there in this study, we want to be everything the Lord has said about this church. Folks, the Lord is looking for local churches today who are serving Him. And who are busy serving Him sacrificing for Him. He wants to see local churches 
who will be steadfast, not giving in to external pressure, internal problems, or pressures from the world. And he wants to see churches that are serious about sticking with the Scriptures and honoring His will. But we know this text does not end there in verse 3. And so we see the Christ. We see the commendation, but we have to also see the complaint or the criticism. Notice how verse 4 continues this address with a very striking word. It's a small word, but it's powerful. And it's the word, but. But. Here they are serving, sacrificing, being steadfast, and being separate But, there was something our Lord saw that He had against this church. Our Lord says, but, I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at the first. Now suppose you were a member in Ephesus. Suppose you were there in the assembly as this letter, this scroll was opened up, and as that messenger, that recipient, began to read the words of Jesus to the congregation. Can you imagine the jaws that would drop? Can you imagine hearing our Lord compliment all these great things you were engaged in doing? Then He says, but... What our Lord has against this church is while He sees busyness, while He sees serving people, while He sees no false teaching, no false doctrine, what He doesn't see, He doesn't see love. I want you to hold your thumb here in Revelation and flip back with me in your Bible to the book of Ephesians. Flip back with me to Ephesians chapter 1 because in Ephesians, <coughs> no less than 20 times Paul wrote about love. So 30 years beforehand, Paul wrote extensively to this group of individuals about love. 30 years later, our Lord says, I'm looking at you I'm examining you. No love. I want you to notice here in Ephesians how the book literally begins and ends with love. Notice in in Ephesians chapter 1, if we drop down to verse 15, Paul says, for this reason, because I have heard... Now watch what he's heard about. I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus. And watch this. And your love toward all the saints. Flip to the end of the book, Ephesians chapter 5. Look how the book ends. Ephesians 5 verse 23 reads, Peace be to the brothers. Now watch this. And love with faith from God the Father, And the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be with you all who, here it is again, love our Lord Jesus Christ. Here it is again, with love incorruptible. The book begins, Paul's heard about their faith and love. The book ends, Paul is encouraging greater faith, greater love, and cites the word love not once, not twice, but three different times. And in between those two bookends, he writes extensively about love. And yet we fast forward 30 or so years later, and our Lord says, when I look at you, I don't see the love you once had. You left the love you had at the first. 
That love you once had no longer describes you. Friends, a church may have a rich history, but we must realize that we can't stop learning We can't stop growing. We can't stop developing ourselves. We can't stop looking in the mirror to more and more be what Jesus wants us to be. We're never going to arrive. We can't just plateau. It doesn't matter what rich past we may have. What rich heritage we can boast of. What about right now? Are we where the Lord wants us to be right now as a church? And the Lord says, I see no love right now when I look at you. When I was a child in my father and mother's closet, there was a single barrel, break barrel, 12 gauge shotgun. I knew it was there, and I knew I better not go in there and touch it. Now that single barrel, break barrel shotgun is in my closet. If I broke down that shotgun, you could look down the long barrel of that shotgun, and guess what? It's just as straight as can be. There's no bumps, there's no deviations, there's no twists, there's no turns, there's no curves. It's just as straight as can be. But guess what? Inside that barrel, it's just as hollow and as empty as it can be. If we're not careful, that's the real danger we can find ourselves in as a church. We can be like Ephesus. Be doing all these good things for Jesus. Busying ourselves with this. Busying ourselves with that. We can be right down the book on every Bible subject. We can keep out all the false teaching, all the error, all the false teachers. But on the inside, we can be just as hollow and as empty as that barrel. Yes, we must be sound in the faith. Yes, we must must preach and teach right doctrine. Yes, we cannot tolerate with the world and with error. But friends, what about demonstrating in those works, in that service, in those stances, authentic love for God and people? Because if we're missing love, we are missing a critical component of what the Lord's looking for in our lives as the church. And if we're missing love, then we need to be revived again. And that leads us back to Revelation chapter 2 to our last observation here in this text. We've seen the Christ... We've seen the commendation. We've seen the criticism. But what about the cure, number four? Our Lord continues by saying, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says, the church is. The one who conquers, I will give. I will grant to eat of the tree of life in the paradise of God. Our Lord calls this church in His cure to do three basic things. To remember, to repent, and to repeat. Notice them one by one. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent. He says, number two, and then repeat. He says, do the works you did at the first. When our Lord says, remember, repent, and repeat, He's not saying, go back and obey the gospel again. He's not saying, here, believe, repent, confess, be baptized again. But what He is saying is this, 
You must change your mind about yourself as a church. That's what repentance is. It's a change of mind that leads to, of course, a change of action. No doubt this church believed they deserved a gold star from the Savior. No doubt they believed they were doing just fine as a church. Our Lord says, remember, repent, and repeat. Change your mind about yourself as a church and go back to the way it once was when you were known for your love. When your love was spoken of far and wide, go back to doing those things that way again. Be that loving church you once were. Now please appreciate with me our Lord's instructions, this cure. Remember, repent, repeat. It's ended with a threat and a promise. And friends, I'll admit to you, our Lord's threat here is quite sobering to think about. Notice what Jesus warns Ephesus. If you will not do this, if you will not remember, repent and repeat, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. You recall the lampstands, chapter 1, verse 20. That's the seven churches. Our Lord is saying, unless you make some serious adjustments in your life as a church, you will cease to be as a church. I will snuff out your lampstand. You will no longer be as a church of my people. I find that extremely sobering. When a church loses love, they will inevitably lose their ability to be a light for the Lord. And our Lord says, no longer are you mine. You cease to be what I'm looking for in my church. But then there is that precious promise. Our Lord always ends with a promise to those who are overcomers. The thought is those who conquer, those who overcome, they can come over. The overcomers get to come over. They get to be with me forever in heaven. That's exactly what our Lord means when He speaks of this tree of life in the paradise of God. In Genesis, that paradise was lost because of sin. Here it's regained because of Jesus, our Savior. And that's what our Lord has in store for those who will heed His Word, make changes, make adjustments, and be the church He calls them to be. They get to come over. They get to be with Him in the paradise of God and feast from the tree of life forever and ever, without end. That's our Lord's cure. Now as you and I step back, our Lord's inviting us to look inward. We have looked into this passage, but we can't leave it at that. We can't say, well, oh, look at them. Look at what they were guilty of doing. Oh, how sad, how foolish. Our Lord's inviting us through these seven verses to turn our gaze inward and think about self. What if the Lord wrote a letter to this congregation? Our Lord knows this church. He's walking among this church. What would Jesus say in that letter? What words of commendation would be included? What words of complaint or criticism would be included? What would our Lord say as He writes tender words of affection to make changes His cure? What words of threat would our Lord give us? 
What promises of comfort, peace, and hope would be ours to know and take to heart? What would our Lord say of us? As we land the plane even more, what about our love? Not just the external actions we're engaged in doing. What about what's on the inside? What about the heart? Is our heart engaged too? Do we really love God? Do we really love His church? Do we really love those who are lost, even those who are lost in sin? Or will the Lord say of us, there are so many good things I see. There's one thing I see missing. When I look in your heart, I don't find true love. Our Lord was once asked, what is the greatest commandment in all the Bible? The Jews knew God's law backwards and forwards. They could tell you how many laws were in that law system. The positive laws, the negative laws, they knew them one by one. And our Lord gave the greatest of them all. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Then our Lord gave this bonus one. The second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 22, 34 to 40. Is that love there in us as an individual? in us as a local church? Or could it be that we need God to revive us again? I'm glad you're here because God's Word can change hearts and change lives. Where do you stand with God tonight? Maybe God's Word tonight, this very night, has touched your heart Maybe you realize you're busy serving, you're doing this, you're doing that, but you're not sure you're doing the right reasons, the right motivations, the right driving power called love. And you want to make some real changes in your heart to be what God wants you to be. You can do that tonight. It begins, though, with a choice, decision, to give your life to Christ and become a New Testament Christian. Nothing more, nothing less, no prefixes, no suffixes, just a Christian. You can be that today. To believe in God, to believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and to be immersed to have your sins washed away. Our Lord said, repent and be baptized through His spokesman and you'll receive the remission of sins. Acts 2, verse 38. Is that your need tonight? To show your love for God by giving your life to Him because you know how much God loves you. He gave His Son for you. As a Christian, where do you stand? Letting God's Word be that mirror of your heart. What's in your heart tonight? Is that love God's looking for there Maybe it's not. Maybe you want prayers, strength, encouragement, support to be that loving servant you know you need to be. We'd love to pray with you and pray for you as we stand and sing this song to encourage you.